You're listening to the Kick Your Boots Up podcast, where we swap stories of the West. Whether you're just waking up or getting in for the day, come on in and kick your boots up. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us on a special WESA edition of the Kick Your Boots Up podcast. We're so excited to be in the legendary Clint Orms showroom. Gasp, I know. I have the, I wish you could feel the energy in here. Um, so many hours of dedication of knowledge and silversmith and craftsmith. Wow, I'm fangirling a little bit here. So thank you, Clint, for taking the time to be with us. This is so fun. Sailor, thanks a lot for having us. You know, right. I, I have so many questions for you personally, but I feel like we better stick to a little bit of a, of a timeline since we have this podcast. But I guess to get us started, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the industry, how you found so Silversmith and um, how it became a part of who you are today. Yeah. Well, I grew up just north of Fort Worth in a little town called Wichita Falls. And my dad worked in a Western store there. And so uh, that store was called The Cow Lot. And Nat Fleming, in my opinion, was one of the greatest guys in the Western wear business because he loved to fit cowboy boots. And that was really what he was known for. If he came in there, he wouldn't let you leave until he, he fit you in a pair of boots. And uh, that's where I kind of learned the, the art of making something special for someone. And even though he had a pair of uh, boots that were on the shelf, he could really make them special for you because he made them fit for you before you left. And it was, it was a great experience. My dad worked there. And then later on, my brother worked there. And then that was the first store that started selling my belts when I was 13 years old. And so they did custom made, I, uh, I was taught how to make belts and uh, do the custom hand tool, you know, and the Calot started selling them. And so that really kind of set me on the path of wanting to make custom pieces for people and pieces that were extra special. And I can't help but stop at that 13 years old. Mm -hmm. What is that like, having started so young and becoming who you are today and just all the growth, the growing pains that you've experienced through all that? What is that like? Well, you, you know, I love the Western business. You know, I think almost everybody in the world wanted to have a pair of cowboy boots, you know. And so um, I got to grow up with my, my dad being a rodeo judge and a rodeo competitor. And so I got to be around, you know, all these really great cowboys. And I just, I wanted to be able to fit in that industry somewhere, you know? And um, so I, I started uh, rodeoing. My dad took me to rodeos and we had friends who went to rodeos when we started like at seven years old and did the Lord Bridges thing. And then when I got to be in, in a little older, I, uh, like I said, was taught how to start making belts. And that's uh, kind of what got me started. What evolved, that yeah. is incredible. And, and having that experience too, that I think just adds to it because having that rodeo background where you started so young, you understand the need, first of all, that your clients need. So that's incredible. And kind of moving on, your, your buckles are very iconic. They have their own style. Tell us a little bit about the, minil the minimalism there and um, the designs that you choose. Yeah. Well, the, all my designs, I believe, are really influenced from the buckles back in the 20s and the 30s. And um, I believe the craftsmen back then that just took a lot of time uh, with their designs and with the handwork and the, and the engraving. And uh, back then the buckles were all made from solid gold and solid silver. And when I started our company, that's what I said I was gonna do, is just use solid gold and solid, sil solid silver on the, on the buckles. And then if you um, use those materials, they're just gonna um, be a family heirloom and they're gonna live really good in 100 years from now. I couldn't agree more in, in hearing stories and seeing people's wedding rings, their buckles that they've earned. I mean, it doesn't matter. They're wearing so-and-so, you know, their grandpa, their dad's bolo ties, things yeah. like that. That is so iconic. And what's it mean to you then to have, to, so you mentioned the, fa the family heirlooms, to be a part of their families now. They've invited you into your home, into their homes almost. Uh, what's that mean? It, it, it's just so great. It's the thing that you can um, keep those family stories going on, you know, that, um, some of my friends, when I was very young, they, re they received their grandfather's buckles when they passed. And I got to see, you know, how, how special that was for them. And when they picked up the buckle every day and they put it on, they, you know, put on a pair, uh, a part of their grandpa and uh, carried on. And um, it, it's, it's probably the most important thing for me is to be able to pass on those positive affirmations from a gift. 
Oh, yes. And, and family is, is key. And, and so that's very beautiful that you've been able to kind of take a full circle with the relationship that you had with your dad and pour it into your craft today. And you mentioned earlier a little bit about the changes you've seen in the 20s, 30s. So let's kind of live there for a second. Let's talk through the changes. Um, what have you seen all across your career? What do you look forward to in the future? Just tell us all of it. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's, I, mean, I, I just think, you know, the hand, the handmade part of the world has always been appreciated. And that's why it was, you know, way, way back in, in the earlier years of my career, the, the craftsmen just took so much pride in what they did. And I, I see that now even uh, with younger craftsmen coming along with uh, the ability to learn, I think I can see them really appreciating the handmade part of the products. So, the, you know, just over the years, it's it's just great to see people still appreciating and knowing that somebody really sat there for hours and worked on that piece. And um, it's, it, it's really what makes our work fun. It's kind of humbling, I can tell. You're very, it's very surreal to think about. And you mentioned earlier that you wanted to, you had a goal to only do silver and gold, you know, the real true metals. So talk to us right. about that. Where do you get your metals from and, and go through all of the this process there? Yeah, you know, I can't tell you exactly where they came out of the ground, but we buy them from uh, different metal suppliers for the jewelry industry. And they uh, come out of Louisiana and out of New Mexico, but I'm sure the metals, uh, you know, comes from all over. Oh yeah, it definitely does. And you have such good quality. So maybe talk through a little bit about the quality of the jewels, the quality of the, the metals you're using too. Yeah, well, that, that's a, something else that's been a great journey in our career. My wife, Roxy, and I really traveled the world to, to see different um, uh, stone cutters and um, to be able to you know, uh, buy some of the best stones that we can, we can buy. And uh, when we set our stones, we set them just the same way a, a Cartier diamond setter would set his Pompeii diamonds or in a piece of a jewelry. And that's really important to me too, that you could take our buckles anywhere in the world and they can, anyone could look at the stones and look at the setting and, and see that we really uh, took the time to, to put the, put good products into it. And one thing I noticed too, we were talking a little bit before we started recording the podcast. Um, you're talking to the legendary Tom Feller here with Justin, yeah. telling about um, all the different rodeos that you've gotten to make buckles for. Sure. So you mentioned Rodeo Houston, and that's a huge iconic one. A lot of rodeos spend all their time and money hoping to make it to Rodeo Houston. Yeah, uh, what's it mean to you then to have these larger rodeos and rodeos in general? Having it should be, you know, you're the creator of their award, their yeah. buckle that they earned, they worked hard for. What's yeah. that mean? Well, it means a lot, you know, because these rodeos, it, it's not easy, an easy business to be in. You know, to, to create a rodeo and keep it going on, and um, you really have to work at it and uh, to keep the stands full, keep the people there, and um, to be able to, to represent the Western industry, you really have to work at it. So making the buckles for... Houston was is a great experience, and I've, I've been able to do. And uh, Houston is a real special rodeo. You know, I know they have over forty thousand volunteers, and they're all professional people that really take their time out of their uh, career to come in and work for the Houston rodeo. And um, people come from all over the world to to study the Houston rodeo because it's such a successful event. And if you haven't been there, I hope you come. <laughs> and we. Uh, Houston is another really super special place for me because when I started my company, two months after I started my company, I was in Houston uh, showing my products there. And uh, I was invited to come there with ML Eddies down in Fort Worth. And uh, we um, were showing my products there. And um, my wife actually came up and introduced herself and, and bought a belt buckle. And that's how I met her. So, Going back to Houston is always a, a great thing for me, and this will be my 31st year to go back. What an incredible yeah. meet cute, as we would say yeah. nowadays, on how you <laughs> met your wife. That is so beautiful. I'm glad that everyone got to hear it here, and I have yeah. so many questions about that. But my first question that comes to mind is how, I mean, since you, she went and bought a belt buckle the first time you met her, have you made anything special for her custom since then? Yeah, oh yeah. But Tell us about Probably not as many as, as I probably would have liked to make, but. Well, we made some really great bracelets and some different buckles for her that are really special. And then it's been fun, uh, like with my son, he's 24 years old now, but he used to come to the shop and my daughter would come to the shop and we would make pieces together for her. And um, we would just 
do what they could do on them and, you know, just hammer them and beat them and turn them into buckles. And, um, and some of those pieces are real special because, um, you know, they didn't have the skill level when they were super young, but we just, we made do and turned out something really great for her. And there again, you know, you have to, you have to hope it's really super special now when she picks it up and puts it on and remembers when Clayton and Mary made them when they were just little kids. Little youngsters and probably for Mother's Day and different holidays like yeah. that. That is, those are timeless pieces. I'm, I'm so glad you shared that with us. And I can't help but wonder too, like how many people out there have continued to, like we talked about earlier, the heirlooms, the family aspect there. But I'm curious, did you, have you continued to train your kids since then? Have you continued to, um, you know, they, got, they started when they were younger just for fun. Do they know the trade? The, um, they do know it pretty good, and um, they both just graduated from college, and they're out in, in their own careers, which is really great. And that's kind of what the way we planned it from the start, that they would step out and, and go out and do their careers, and we'll see if they circle back in. That's right. Once they live life a little bit, experience the world. And before we go, I just have one more question for you. What is the most challenging process? Because this is, I mean, hours and hours and hours, depending on the piece, depending on a simple or more intricate what do you think is the hardest, most time-consuming piece going into any of your designs? Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes it's trying to uh, figure out exactly what the person wants to do with the buckle and how they want that to accent their personality. Because it is an accessory that I believe a, a man or a lady can actually wear every day. You know, they can wear it with different outfits and they can um, just, you know, wear, wear the buckle everywhere. I mean, the buckle uh, that Tom Feller was wearing earlier, I mean, that says everything about Tom. It's just a great piece, and it's a, it's a, it's a buckle that anyone would love to wear. I didn't make it, but uh, I, I, it's a really terrific buckle, and it really sets off his personality, and, and it kind of uh, shows Tom. Oh, yeah, and that's what's fun, that you get to kind of, without even knowing the customer sometimes, you get to kind of give them a piece of their style that they're going into. And, and since we're here at WESA talking about fashion, what are some trends that you are seeing personally within your business that you're really hoping does good in the future or is currently doing well that you've seen a lot of walking around? Yeah. Well, the, the one piece buckle, and we call them a trophy buckle, is, is seem to be coming back and being really super popular now. And that's a, I mean, that's the buckle that wa was given back in the, the 20s and the 30s in the rodeo era. And uh, it's just really, it's, it's a beautiful uh, look. But you can see um, in the fashion world, you know, um, with even like a Ralph Lauren is, you know, pulling out some buckles like that from the past and bringing them up and you'll see them in on fashion shoots all over the world. That's got to feel so iconic. So being new to the company, I've seen a lot of pictures in the archives at Justin. There's so many different um, aspects of the company, but one is particularly dealing with WISA and the salesman and everything here. The salesman of the year buckles for Justin Brands, they're iconic. I've seen pictures of them, the mm -hmm. detailing, the time, and it's, it's kind of a twofold here because you put time and, and effort into these buckles and then they put time and effort into earning the title of Salesman of the Year. So talk to us about the, those buckles and what it's like being a part of that. Well, it, was, it was really exciting when I got to call to, to, to make those buckles because I love that Justin takes care of the Cowboys. You know, I mean, with Justin Sports Medicine, it's just remarkable the program that, that you guys have had and, and the uh, longevity of that program. It's, it's just served so many people well. And so when I got the opportunity to, to highlight the salesman for the, the company, Justin, it was a great opportunity to pull out some, you know, some great um, designs and, and make a super classic buckle, which is, is Justin. It's just a great classic company, and it's, it's been around forever, and so they, they do more than just make boots. And so it was a great thing for me to be able to be a part of and just... Um, so what I tried to do with that buckle is, is you know, go back, back again, just use our solid principles and keep it pretty simple. But we did some really nice filigree work on the buckle, and did, I did a combination of three different golds on it, and um, hopefully I made the salesman really proud because it's just great that the work that those guys do, and it's not easy being a salesman out there. You're exactly right. It's not. We mentioned family a little bit, and, and that's so cool. Thank you for having your family be a part of our family. Oh, it thanks. seems like a natural tie, but I know it goes a long way here at Justin Brands. Thanks. Clint, it has been iconic, legendary, humbling, all of the words to have been able to sit down at a table and take a little bit of your time to get to know your story. Thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of the listener's heart. 
We're so inspired by your work. Continue to keep going. And again, thank you so much for letting us take your time. You bet. Well, I hope that the, the best is to come.